Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to New Life Church. It's so good to have you joining us today, whether you're here in person or you're watching online from somewhere else. We're just so thankful for this chance to connect with you. And uh, we got a lot of stuff going as summer kind of hits full swing. This week, we got a group going to kids camp. Uh, we've got uh, the We Love Kids party coming up. Uh, youth is happening this Wednesday. Wednesday. Tori, our intern, is going to be leading youth this Wednesday while Pastor Sale and I are at kids camp. And thank you, Tori, for leading us through communion as well. So a lot of stuff going on, a lot of good things and a lot of things to jump into. And I want to encourage you, if you're looking to get more deeply connected or find a place to be involved, we have a place for you. I guarantee it. So uh, today we are going to be continuing on in our series, Man on a Mission, where we're going passage by passage through the book of Luke. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 11 and starting in verse 37, where the title of our message this morning is How to Be a Hypocrite. How to be a hypocrite, probably not what you thought you'd be learning when you got ready to come to church today or when you logged in online. But uh, it's an important thing for us to talk about as we talk about hypocrisy today, uh, because I've never heard hypocrisy or somebody being referred to as a hypocrite seen in a positive way and for good reason. But let me illustrate a little bit for you exactly what I'm talking about. So when I was a kid, I remember one Easter, I was so excited because I got a giant chocolate Easter bunny for, for in my Easter basket. I was so excited. I'm looking at that thing and it was huge. And I was like, this is going to be like chocolate for weeks. It's going to be awesome. And so finally I got to the point where my parents let me open up the chocolate bunny and eat it. And so I opened it up, unwrapped it. I took a bite of the chocolatey goodness and right away I was disappointed. Does anybody know why? Because it was hollow. Who does that? That's terrible, right? Okay, you see this big chocolate thing and you're like, this is supposed to like be an incredible huge chocolate bar, but in reality, it's just a little shell of chocolate around a whole bunch of air. There's really nothing underneath the surface. Now, incidentally, Later that year at Christmas time, uh, somebody gave me a chocolate Santa. And so this time I was smart and I knew not to have too high of expectations. And so my parents let me unwrap and take a bite of that Santa. I took a bite and I was like absolutely excited because the Santa wasn't hollow. And so that led me to a very, as like eight or nine year old kid, a very important spiritual conclusion. And that's really the point of today. And that is that Santa is better than the Easter Bunny. Okay. So you guys have a great day. Well, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, it, it, it was it was different. Why? Because it was filled with chocolate. Like it wasn't just a shell of something. There was actually substance beneath it. And when we talk about hypocrisy, when we talk about somebody who's a hypocrite, that's the that's the comparison we're making. Hypocrisy is the idea of somebody who's who's playing a part. They're they're being an actor. What's happening on the outside isn't reflective of what's actually happening on the inside. And as I said, we don't ever think of hypocrisy as a good thing. We always think of that negatively and and for good reason. And today as we look at Luke chapter 11 and starting in verse 37, what we're going to talk about today is that God wants your deep commitment, not a superficial show. God wants us to not be like a chocolate Easter bunny where there's just a shell of looking Christian or a shell of trying to look good on the outside. Instead, he wants us to be like Santa Claus. You can write that one out. Jesus wants us to be like Santa Claus. Where where there's substance beneath the surface, there's something more that's happening there. God wants our deep commitment, not a superficial show. So in Luke chapter 11 and starting in verse 37, it says, while Jesus was was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table, and the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. So what's happening here is Jesus has been invited over to the house of this man who's a Pharisee. Now Jesus, if you've been with us through the book of Luke, has already had several interactions with Pharisees, and let's just say they usually end up in some fireworks happening, some things going on. I mean, it's it's uh, there's conflict 
conflict. There's always tension there because the Pharisees were a, a set of religious leaders who were all about the rules. They were all about the law. They wanted to make sure that everybody knew the rules and everybody followed the rules and they didn't want to have any accusation that they didn't follow the rules. And so in order to do this, one of the things that they did is they took the commands that were in Scripture and they said, okay, we want to make sure we follow all of those commands. So in order to follow those commands, we're going to make rules that are even stricter than what's in the Bible so that we make sure we don't even get close to follow or violating one of the rules that we would find in the Bible. And when it talks about them being, uh, this Pharisee being astonished that Jesus didn't wash before dinner, this is what it's talking about. In the Old Testament, there were all kinds of different purification rituals and things that people would go through that was supposed to kind of symbolize a, a cleansing of, of, the, of, of somebody's life from sin or from impurity or any of those kinds of things. But when it's talking about this meal, Jesus, what it's talking about is that Jesus didn't wash his hands before the meal. Now, the Pharisees' astonishment is not a hygiene issue He's making a spiritual judgment about Jesus because he didn't wash his hands before the meal. Essentially, the idea went like this, that if Jesus was, you know, out doing whatever he was doing, he might accidentally, with his hands, touch somebody who was sinful and have their sin, like, transferred to his hands, or he might touch something that a sinful person touched, and and that would defile his hands as sinful, and then he was going to eat something with his hands that would make him defiled or make him sinful in some way. Never mind, none of this was written in Scripture that this would be something that Jesus would have to do. This was just a tradition that they added on top of what was in Scripture. So the Pharisees all upset about this, and now Jesus is going to respond to the Pharisee. He's going to talk to him about several different things, and in fact, he's going to talk to uh, not just Pharisees, but to what he's going to call lawyers or those who are teachers of the religious law. And he's going to respond to them by saying, woe to you six times, three to the Pharisees, three to the teachers of the law. And so as we get into this, first of all, I want to explain what he means when he says, woe to you. What he's saying when he says, woe to you, is not a pronouncement of like judgment or condemnation, like, um, like he wants them to be in a bad place. Woe to you is almost a, an expression of pity. It's an expression of like, you're in a pitiful position right now. You're in a place that, that we wouldn't envy. You're not in a good place. And, it, and it's, it's spoken as a rebuke to them, as kind of a correction to them, but not in the sense of judgment or condemnation like they're beyond God's grace. He's saying, there's something pitiful or there's something unenviable happening into your life, and I'm going to name what it is. So Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to rebuke them or he's going to give them these different statements of saying, this is a pitiful place for you to be in. And as he does, what he's going to do is he's going to line us out with uh, some different things that I think are marks of a hypocrite, which is why we talk about this sermon called How to Be a Hypocrite, because Jesus is going to line out different marks of what it looks like to be a hypocrite or how somebody could act in a way that's hypocritical. So he starts off here. We see in uh, verse 39, Jesus responds to the Pharisee, who's astonished that he didn't wash his hand again, which was a tradition, which was something they added, not something that was written in scripture that he had to do. So it says, Jesus, or the Lord uh, said to him, now you Pharisees, did I skip a line? No, I didn't. He says, and the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give us alms, those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Now, Jesus uses this illustration of a cup. Imagine that, that I was outside, like, digging in my backyard through the mud and the muck and all this kind of stuff with a cup and tossing it out, and you're like, hey, I'm thirsty. I'm like, sure, let me go get you a drink of water. And I use that same cup and fill it up with water and give it to you. Are you going to want to drink from it? Probably not. What if I say, no, don't worry, it's okay. I wipe down the outside of the cup before I put the water in it. Still not okay, right? There's still a bunch of junk inside. And what Jesus is saying to this Pharisee and what he's about to line out as he gets into those statements where he says, woe to you, he's saying, you're so concerned about how things look on the outside that you're ignoring what's happening inwardly. 
You're more concerned with how you look and how you're perceived than you are about caring about what's happening in your heart. So he says, if you want to honor God, don't worry about just the outside because God created the inside too. Invite Jesus, invite God to transform your hearts and that's when things will actually be the way God wants them to do. That's what he's saying here. So he gets to his first statement where he says, whoa, in verse 42. And again, Jesus is going to line out different ways that we can recognize or different characteristics of somebody who might be a hypocrite. So in verse 42, he says, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Now, what's Jesus talking about here? He's pointing to a practice, a tradition that the Pharisees had where when they had like an herb garden, they would go out in their garden and they would tithe off of that garden. So what is tithing? Tithing is when we give a tenth of what we've had or what we've gotten as an increase, we give it back to God. The Bible talks about tithing. The Bible encourages us to tithe as a way for us to trust God with uh, as our provider, as a way for us to recognize recognize, God, everything I have is yours, and I'm trusting you to be my provider, not my money or not my positions or possessions or whatever. I'm giving back to you as as an exercise of trust. And so, so tithing wasn't the issue. He's saying, you tithe mint and rue and all these other herbs. Interestingly enough, when the Bible talks about tithing, it would talk about tithing their grain but it would never talk about tithing their herb gardens. What Jesus is saying is this. He says, you're so concerned about making it, making sure that it looks like you're following every rule that you're going out to your herb garden and counting the leaves of every herb and taking a tenth of them and giving them to God, but you're ignoring the big picture. You're neglecting justice and love. In other words, you're you're trying to check off that you followed a rule without actually living your life in a way that's reflecting God's heart for the world, that people would know God's love, that they would experience his grace and his favor, that God's justice would be upheld within the world. He's saying the problem isn't your tithing. He says, "You, you should do that. That's good. But the problem is you're doing that thinking that in doing that, you're doing everything you need to do. Now, again, we have to recognize whether it was the washing of hands, which was not commanded, but was a tradition, or the tithing of an herb garden, which was not commanded, but a tradition, the Pharisees were more concerned about following the rules than they were about actually living for God. So one of the ways we might be able to recognize a hypocrite is when we recognize it this way, that hypocrites care more about traditions than transformation. They care more about the traditions that they need to upheld. You have to wash your hands. Again, that's nowhere written in Scripture. That wasn't a hygiene issue. They were making a spiritual judgment about Jesus based off of that. You have to tithe from your herb garden. Again, not written in Scripture, a tradition that the Pharisees had. He says, you care more about your traditions than you care about your heart actually being transformed to the point where you're going to go out into the world and spread the love and the justice of God to people who come into contact with you. Jesus is saying you care more about checking off the list of your traditions and the rules that you've written than you care about actually living for God. Now, that's a, that's a pretty pointed accusation that he makes to them. And he's, again, he's not condemning them. He's saying, woe to you in the sense of like, this is a pitiful place to be. This isn't the way you should want to live your life. Yes, tithing is good and commanded in Scripture, but you're even going beyond what Scripture commands. And yes, it's good to wash your hands, but that's not a spiritual issue. But you're making judgments about people based off of traditions rather than actually living out what God's heart for you would be to know help people know the love and the justice of God in the world that you're living in. So a mark of a hypocrite is you care more about traditions than you care about transformation. 
I had a story from uh, somebody that I know who's a pastor. He was talking about a, an Easter service he did one time. And he was at this church and he was doing this Easter service. And they had all kinds of people show up at this Easter service, all kinds of people who'd never been to their church before. And, and they were talking about Jesus and they were talking about the resurrection. And there were people who were giving their hearts to Jesus. And he said, it was an incredible service. And after the service was over, somebody came up to him and they said, you know what? You're a terrible pastor. And he's like, what? You know, this was an incredible service. What just happened? He's, You're a terrible pastor because every Easter we're supposed to sing hymn number 372 and we did not sing that hymn today. They cared about a tradition and they missed the whole transformation of the lives of people that was happening around them. Now, let me just say this. There's nothing wrong with traditions. It's okay to have traditions. I, our family has uh, Christmas traditions or Easter traditions or family traditions, things that we do. There's nothing wrong with traditions as long as our traditions don't get in the way of us actually living our lives for God the way that he wants us to. Uh, that, that, that our traditions, sometimes they can get in the way of us actually expressing God's heart to the world. Again, tithing the herb garden or washing the hands wasn't a command of Scripture. It was a tradition of the Pharisees, and they cared more about their traditions than they actually cared about allowing those traditions to transform their hearts. That's a mark of hypocrisy. It's a mark of hypocrisy when we care more about our traditions than we care about transformation. Now, Jesus has another statement of woe he's going to give to them in verse 43. He says, Woe to you, Pharisees, and for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. What's Jesus saying in these verses? He's saying, well, woe to you. This is a pitiful position to be in. You don't want to adopt this kind of attitude that the Pharisees had, which was this, that when they showed up to synagogue or when they went to church, they wanted to be in the position or in the seats that were in front of everybody. So people saw them, so people knew that they were there, so people could honor them for being in these great, uh, these great t seats of the teachers and other people of authority and influence. They said, when you go to synagogue, you want to be in these places, these best seats of authority in these places where people see you and they honor you because you get to sit in those seats. You must be a great spiritual leader. And he says, you like the greetings in the marketplaces. Oftentimes when a spiritual leader, uh, when a religious leader would go out to the marketplaces, people would come to them and they would, they would honor them as this great spiritual leader and they might want a blessing from them or a word from them or something like that. But they would, they would hold them in high esteem and everybody would kind of see, hey, that guy's a great spiritual leader. Look at that guy. Let's go talk to him. Let's go, let's go interact with him. He's saying, woe to you Pharisees. This is a pitiful, unenviable place to be when what you care about is having the best seats and being honored out in public. But he says in verse 43, the reality is that you're like an unmarked grave. People walk over the grave, not realizing it's there, but inside it's actually dead. He's saying, you like to get all these accolades. You liked for people to see you, and you like for people to honor you, and you like for people to be in a place where, where they lift you up as being this great religious person, but inside you're actually dead. And people walk past you, and they might honor you, but they don't realize that it's like walking past an unmarked grave. It, it might look okay on the outside, but actually inside is only death. Jesus points to a very serious issue here, which is another mark of hypocrisy. How, how can we know if somebody might be acting as a hypocrite? How could I know if I might be acting as a hypocrite? And the second way he says is that hypocrites care more about their status than their character. They care more about the way that they're seen by other people than they care about God actually forming their hearts. They care more about being held in high esteem than they care about Jesus actually transforming them on the inside. Now, we live in a society, we live in a world, we live in a place where people oftentimes want to have a platform. They want to be publicly known. They want to put themselves out there in front of people. 
that's, again, not necessarily a bad thing. It's not bad if people honor those who are in leadership or people honor people who are excellent at something. The question is, is the goal to be honored or is the goal to honor Jesus? And if he gives you the platform, then great. The Pharisees were in a place where they cared more about receiving honor. They cared more about their status. And so they did everything they could to look good in the eyes of people. They didn't do it to please God They did it to gain popularity. They cared more about their status than they did about their character. The third thing we see Jesus continues on, third mark of a hypocrite we read about in verse 45. It says, one of the lawyers answered him and said, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. So the lawyer is a a teacher of the law, of the religious law. So not a lawyer in the sense that we would think necessarily like, you know, I got a parking ticket and I need to go hire a lawyer to go to court for me, that type of thing. This is a lawyer in the sense that this person would have known and studied God's word. They would have known and studied the scriptures and they would have known them inside and out. The religious law, they would have known it inside and out. And Jesus, the, the, tea, or the lawyer says, Jesus, you're, you're speaking about and you're rebuking these Pharisees, but what you're saying actually applies to us too. I'm kind of offended right now. And how does Jesus respond? In verse 46, he says, um, woe to you lawyers also. So you're also not in a great position, you lawyers, you people who think you know all the scriptures. He says this, for you load people with burdens hard to bear And you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one finger. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you guys know all the rules inside and out. You know the scriptures inside and out. And and, and here's the reality. If you were to talk to one of these religious leaders, to one of these lawyers, and you were to ask them a question about the Bible, they would probably give you the right answer. They would probably know the right answer. They'd be able to quote scriptures and and they would know all the ins and outs of that things. But Jesus says, you're in a pitiful position. You're in an unenviable position. Why? Because you load people down with all these rules, with all these burdens, with all these things that you expect of them, but you do nothing to help them actually live them out. You're not willing to lift a finger to help them bear this load. He's saying, you're willing to preach at people. You're willing to point fingers at people and tell them where they're going wrong and why they don't have their lives together. You're willing to point to them and judge and condemn them, but you're not willing to actually step into their lives and try to help them live for Jesus. You're not willing to actually try to step into their lives and help them understand who God is and how he can change them. You're going to weigh them down with heavy burdens, but you're going to do nothing to help them live them out. That's a, that's a challenging thing he says to them because here's the reality. Like I said, the lawyers were right most of the time. They knew the right answers. But Jesus says where you get it wrong is not that you have the wrong information, but that you're not willing to actually help people know how to live it out in their lives. So we get to a third mark of hypocrisy, a third way that we might be able to identify hypocrisy. Jesus says here that hypocrites care more about being experts than being loving. They care more about knowing the right answers than they care about actually helping people experience God's power in their lives. Is knowing the right answers wrong? No. It's good for us to know Scripture. It's good for us to study the Word of God. It's good for us to be able to give the right answers. But notice Jesus, even in his own life, didn't just sit back as the one who gave the right answers and and laid heavy burdens on people and expected them to figure it out themselves. Jesus himself actually came from heaven to earth to get involved to lift up more than just a finger, but rather to give of his very own life so that people could understand who God was and so people could experience the grace and the mercy and the love of God. It wasn't wrong that the lawyers were experts in the religious law. They knew scriptures. That was all good. What was wrong is they didn't care about actually helping people know what it meant or what it looked like to live that out in their own lives. And then Jesus continues on in verse 47. He says, woe to you. He's still talking to the lawyers, the religious leaders. He says, woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, 
and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation." Now, this could seem like some weird tangent Jesus went off on. Like he was talking to these people about their hypocrisy, and all of a sudden he's talking about prophets and tombs and people dying. And like, what in the world is Jesus trying to get to here? Well, if we're going to understand what Jesus is is trying to point to as he talks about this in these verses, we have to understand what the role or what what the job of an Old Testament prophet was. An Old Testament prophet was somebody that that God would give a message to that prophet so that they would go and speak that message to the people that God was sending them to. So we talked last week a little bit about Jonah. God gave Jonah a message to go to the Ninevites and to proclaim that message to the Ninevites, right? So as you look through the Old Testament, God sends a number of prophets to speak his message to his people. Here's the problem. Oftentimes, the message that God gave the prophets to speak was not one that people wanted to hear. Oftentimes, the message that that the prophets were sent by God to proclaim, they would proclaim sometimes to, to kings or to leaders, to people in high positions of authority. And if they were to proclaim that word to them, it would be a message that the people who were supposed to hear it didn't want to hear. They didn't want to respond to that message. They didn't want to hear what the prophet had to say. So the prophet was put in a position where they had to go tell somebody the news that they didn't want to hear. They had to go give the bad news. I don't know if any of you have ever had to do that before, it's not a fun place to be in. So what happened in, the, in some of these cases was that whether it was kings or other people who were in high leadership, if they didn't like what the prophets had to say, sometimes they would persecute them. They would try to push them down. They would try to silence them. They would try to stop them from speaking. They would reject that they were from God, and they would do everything they could to stop them and to silence them, even to the point where some of them would kill the prophets. And so what Jesus is trying to point to in this is he's saying, your forefathers, when God sent a messenger to them to speak his truth to them, would try to silence them because they didn't want to hear what they had to say. And he says, now you in this day, you're building tombs to these prophets because you're saying, well, let's recognize and honor these prophets. But essentially what Jesus is saying is, it's easy for you to honor a prophet when you don't have to listen to what they say because they're already dead. It's easy for you to honor people that came hundreds of years ago when the message that they came to deliver isn't something you actually have to grapple with in your life. You build their tombs. But here's what Jesus says, and here's how he's turning it on them. He's saying, but when God sends prophets to you now, you respond in the exact same way your forefathers did. When God sends people to you now, he's talking to these lawyers, to speak a message to you. If you don't want to hear that message, you respond exactly in the same way your forefathers did. Now, how can he say that? Well, he has two examples that are really easy to put right in front of them. Number one is John the Baptist. John the Baptist came, and we've talked about John the Baptist throughout this series, as a prophet sent from God to proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God. And guess what? Most of the Pharisees and the religious leaders rejected him and tried to silence him at times. But the greater example is the person that's standing right in front of them talking to them. Jesus is saying, God has sent me here to proclaim his message to you, and what are they going to end up doing with Jesus? they're going to take him to the cross and crucify him. Jesus is saying, you know, you're in an unenviable position, in a pitiful place. Why? Because even when God tries to speak to you, if, he, if what he's trying to speak to you isn't what you want to hear, you just cast it aside and ignore it. So another mark of hypocrisy, another way we might be able to tell if someone's a hypocrite, is that hypocrites care more about staying comfortable than staying humble. The religious leaders cared more about about not having to have God speak to them something they didn't want to hear. They wanted to stay right where they were. They liked things the way that they were. They wanted to keep the status quo. 
And when God entered into the equation and tried to speak something to them, to to correct them, to help them move in the right direction, they didn't want to hear it, so what did they do? They tried to silence that message. There are times in our lives where God will challenge us, where God will speak to us a challenging word, something that we don't like to hear, something that might even offend us at first. But I heard something this last week that really stuck with me. It was this. It said that submission doesn't start until you disagree. If God wants to speak something to you and you are like, yeah, I'm already doing that. That's great. That's easy. But submission doesn't start until God says, hey, you know that thing in your life that you're holding on to? You know that thing that's really near and dear to your heart? I actually want you to give that up. How do we respond in those times? Do we care more about being comfortable than being humble and saying, God, I, I don't want to let go of that thing. I don't want to move on from that. But God, I want to stay humble before you and say yes to whatever it is you would ask of me. This is what Jesus is saying to them in these verses. Now we get to his final woe, his final kind of rebuke of them in verse 52. He says, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. So Jesus is saying to them, here's the problem. You lawyers, you experts in Scripture, you experts in the religious law, he says, you're withholding the key of knowledge from the people that you're being supposed to, supposed to be serving. Now, the whole like fundamental part of what it meant to be a lawyer, to be the, to be the teacher of the religious law, was that they were supposed to know a bunch of stuff. And what Jesus is saying to them is this. He's saying, you might know things in your head, but you're not actually living them out. You're not actually letting the things that you know transform your life. And so you might have the keys of knowledge, but you haven't entered into what the implications of that knowledge actually are. And in leading in that way, you're actually leading others to live the same way that you are. And that's not a place that you want to be. That's a pitiful unenviable place. That's a place that is, that is a miserable place to be. And so it says in verse 53, as Jesus went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something they might say. They're illustrating exactly what Jesus just said to them. You're withholding the keys of knowledge. In other words, you're trying to catch me on a technicality instead of actually trying to listen and allow what I'm teaching you to change and transform you. The religious leaders cared so much about the religious system that they had set up that they didn't want anything to interrupt it. Never mind that the people that the system was supposed to serve were being burdened and weren't being changed or transformed by God. They didn't care about that. They didn't care that their religious system wasn't leading more people to love God or to live for him. All they cared about was that they kept their system in place. And that leads us to the final mark of hypocrisy that I'm going to point out to us today, that hypocrites care more about the system than the outcome. We care more about things happening the way we want them to than we care about whether or not it's actually accomplishing what God wants for it to. We care more about church, you know, if you're a hypocrite in this sense, you care more about about church looking the way I want it to, and we're going to sing the songs I want, and I'm going to sit in the place I want to sit, and I'm going to do the things I want to do, rather than caring about whether or not it's actually being effective in reaching people to know and and have their hearts transformed by God. That's a mark of hypocrisy. That's what Jesus says. Now, I named this message, How to Be a Hypocrite, kind of tongue-in-cheek. Why? Because if we're honest, most of us don't need to learn how to be a hypocrite. We already know. If you're honest with yourself you're going to recognize that there's been times in your life where you have acted like a hypocrite. There's been times in your life you're going to recognize where you've said one thing, you've done another. There's going to be times where you would reflect and you would recognize that you're a whole lot more like an Easter bunny than you are Santa Claus. That there's a shell on the outside that you're trying to make look good, but underneath there's no substance. And what Jesus is pointing out to us here is that it's not about the outward appearance of things. 
It's about allowing Jesus to transform the very core of who you are. And so today, if I could offer any challenge or encouragement to us as we think about these scriptures, it would be to invite Jesus to change you from the inside out. To invite Jesus to transform who you are in your very heart instead of just trying to look like you've got everything put together on the outside. Now, I think this is a really challenging message for us to hear. And I think no matter where you're at in your walk with God, this message has something that you can grab, grab onto and hold onto to, to allow Jesus to challenge you with. Because here's the reality. If you are a follower of Jesus today, if you're a Christian, if you've received Christ as your Savior today, whether here in the room or watching online, like I said, we don't need instructions about how to be a hypocrite. If you're honest you would probably recognize that there are times or places or areas of your life where you care more about what it looks like on the outside than the transformation that's happening on the inside. You care more about your tradition than the transformation. You care more about your status than your character. There are times in our lives where we can look and we can recognize, God, there's a deeper work that needs to be done there. I'm not trying to just act or play a part. God, I need you to do a deeper work in my life. And so if you're a follower of Jesus today, I invite you to allow Jesus to have a hard conversation with you, to maybe speak a word into your life that, You're not going to like hearing, but you need to hear. We all need to come to those points and those places in our life where we experience that. But today, maybe as you're hearing this, you would say to yourself, well, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a follower of Jesus. And honestly, for many people who aren't followers of Jesus, this is one of the reasons why. Because they would say, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. Can I tell you today that If you're not a follower of Jesus, and this has been a challenge or an issue for you, that you see the hypocrisy that happens in the lives of people who claim to be followers of Jesus but aren't actually living it out, can I just can I just say something to you as a pastor? I'm so sorry. We need to be better. We need to allow Jesus to transform us from the inside out. And I'm sorry if you've been hurt by the hypocrisy of of a follower of Jesus or a church or a leader who's tried to do something that looked good on the outside, but inwardly they weren't actually allowing Jesus to transform them. I'm so sorry if that's been your experience. I pray that you, you would be willing to forgive us because we are all fallen, we are broken. And while Jesus transforms us, that transformation is a process that we need to walk through and we need to have happen more and more every single day. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, can I just invite you to also think of this in your own life? Say, Jesus, you know, I might not claim to be a Christian, but being a hypocrite can come easy to me too. And the only way that I can try to find any kind of wholeness and goodness and and find God's best in my life is to invite Jesus to transform me from the inside out. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, can I invite you to say, Jesus, I need you to transform me from the inside out. Because as you come to him in that way, he will meet you right where you are. It doesn't matter what your past or your mistakes are. It doesn't matter what hypocrisy you've participated in 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 your own life. Jesus will meet you right where you are and he can transform you from the inside out. So right now I want to invite everybody to bow your heads and to close your eyes just as a way for you to kind of shut out any distractions that might be going on around you and to just put yourself in a place where you're opening your heart to hear from Jesus. And as you do that, in the next few moments as we pray... I challenge you to ask Jesus to speak into your life, to point out the areas of hypocrisy within you. Like I said, most of us don't need instructions about how to be a hypocrite. We can do that all fine on our own. So ask Jesus to point out those areas in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, go before him and say, Jesus, I need your transformation to continue working deeper and deeper into me. I I, I need to continue to surrender myself to you. And if you're not a follower of Jesus today, I invite you to go to Jesus 
and say, Jesus, for the first time in my life, I'm recognizing that I need you to do a work in me that I can't do by myself and to invite him to enter into your life and to bring that transformation to you. Whether you're here in person or you're watching online right now, I believe that God wants to speak to you. And as he does, he wants to do a deeper work than just making the outside look clean, than just making it look like, well, if I become a Christian, I just have a bunch of rules that I have to follow, and that's what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. It's all about allowing him to change our hearts. So if you're not a follower of Jesus today, I invite you to do that. I'm going to lead us in prayer right now. And as I do, I just invite you to to respond in whatever way is appropriate for you and where you're at spiritually. And then our worship team is going to close us in a time of worship. And as they lead us in worship, my prayer is that that worship would be a response and an affirmation to God of saying, God, I am surrendering myself to you and asking you to empower me to live this way. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth, for for living a perfect life, for dying a death you didn't deserve, for going to the cross for our sake, for being a sacrifice for us, that shedding your blood, that our sins might be forgiven. Jesus, today we recognize we need you. And we need you not to just help us look good on the outside. We need you to transform us from the inside out. So Jesus, for those who are, who are hearing this right now and who are in a place where they're saying, I've never given my heart or my life to Jesus, I pray today would be a moment, right now would be a moment where they would recognize following Jesus isn't about just trying to follow a bunch of rules. Following Jesus about, is about allowing him to change my heart. And I pray that today they would embrace that and they would walk into that and that they would ask you into their lives to bring that transformation. But for those of us who are followers, who are your followers, Jesus, I pray that you would help us to recognize if there are any areas in our lives where there's hypocrisy within us. If there are any areas within us where we care more about our traditions than we care about being transformed, where we care more about our status than we care about our character, where we're more, where we're more concerned about being comfortable than we are about being humble. Whatever it is for us, God, I pray that you would point out if there's any areas in our lives that we need to surrender to you. And then God, help us to be humble enough to surrender, to give it to you and to allow you to do your work in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord Jesus, we recognize today that if we're going to live genuine, authentic lives for you, lives that are, that are lived out of the substance of the transformation that you've done in our hearts, that we can't do it in our own strength. So I pray that you would pour out your spirit into our lives, that you would empower us to live for you from the deepest depths of who we are, the core of our being. Help us, God, to have hearts that say yes to you, whatever it is you would ask of us. And that, God, we wouldn't live lives where we're just trying to look good on the outside, but it's hollow in the middle. Instead, God, help us to have lives that are rooted and grounded in the power of God, the power of Jesus to transform and change every single part of us. Pray that you would do that work in us, that you would continue that work in us, that you would bring that work to completion in us as we continue to follow you every single day. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Now as we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in the grace of God. Have a great week. We'll see you back next Sunday.